Our next speaker, M.J. Rosenberg, is another longtime observer and trenchant analyst of U.S. policy towards Israel-Palestine. As I'm sure most of you know, Rosenberg brings a perspective, the unique perspective of an insider to the activities of the Israel lobby, whom he originally worked for and whose activities he later came to deplore. During the 1980s, Rosenberg served as editor of the Near East Report, APAC's biweekly publication on Middle East policy. This was followed by 15 years on the Hill as an aide to various Democratic members of Congress, where he acquired invaluable first-hand experience of how actually APAC works on Congress to shape U.S. policy on the Middle East. This first-hand experience is reflected in the many highly critical columns he wrote for Media Matters during 2009 to 2012, which many of us eagerly awaited for his insights about just what APAC was up to at any particular moment in time. When Media Matters, a progressive news center, turned out to be progressive except for Palestine, Rosenberg resigned. Oh, I was fired, but oh. <laughs> then I resigned. <laughs> well, that's interesting. <laughs> I didn't want to use that word unless it was absolutely clear. Oh, I was. Yeah. All right. There was there, no doubt that there was a lot of pressure. Absolutely. His columns can now be read in The Nation magazine and Huffington Post. M.J. Rosenberg. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, politics is my life, so I like to, you know, see people involved with it. It's so important. You know, we always hear it, but I was thinking yesterday, and I know, don't yell at me if this seems like an exaggeration and I'm like a far out crazy person, but in my opinion, what happened in Paris and what's happened in all these other places around the world with terrorism a large part of it lays at the fact that the 2000 presidential election in the United States was stolen. Um, this is all George Bush, Iraq War, neocons, all these people. It's not, these things just don't happen. And, um, and so I just think it's always, you know, and I think my cause this year is going to be if anyone tells me that they're not voting in the 2000, no, November 2000 election because their favorite candidate didn't get nominated, I'm strangling that person. <laughs> I mean, really, it is just so important, except not important for any of you because you can vote for whoever you want because you live in Massachusetts. <laughs> but, you know, it's still important. We, in Maryland, in my home state, we always say we can vote for whoever we want. And last time we didn't like the Democratic nominee. None of us could stand the Democratic nominee, so a lot of us didn't vote for him. We have a Republican governor, so um, you know it does matter. I want to say something. This is a this is a prelude to my to my optimistic main thing. I want to talk about the Jews a little bit, of which I am not proudly one. Proudly is stupid to anything I didn't choose. So I'm like, oh, I'm proud. I'm a proud male. Okay. Um, <laughs> Any movement to change for progressive politics in America has to involve the Jewish community. Every movement in America, every progressive movement, the last time a progressive movement was not heavily, almost to the point of dominated by Jews in this country, was William Jennings Bryan in 1896, when they were arguing about bimetallism and silver and whatever that crazy stuff was when it was the farmers because Jews were never been I mean never big big farmers that wasn't their issue the Jews I mean if you think about labor the, uh, the GLBT movement the women's movement I mean the anti-war movement could you have was there a Vietnam War de for those older people out there like me was there a Vietnam War demonstration movement? If you took the Jews out, there would have been 10 people standing around. <laughs> I mean, the, the women's movement, when you look at the people like Bella Abzug and Gloria Steinem and uh, Betty Friedan, and, and, you know, it's just like, we can't, they can't. But the good news is, the Jews are coming back. What they have been is out AWOL on this issue. 
because of that phrase that we are a progressive except for Palestine, that is changing. It's not changing necessarily among our generation, the older people. Um, sadly enough, the 60s generation has turned out to be a big flop when it comes to the Israel-Palestinian issue. They're as bad as their parents were. But the kids are really different. I mean, and now you see, you know, J Street and Jewish Voice for Peace and the Open Hillel movement, and overarching all of that is the fact that it is not cool to be down with Israel for Jewish kids anymore. It is a controversial position to take. And it's like, whereas when I was in school, I mean, and, and, and any of you were in school, particularly if you were Jewish, or even if you weren't, the, 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 the default position was pro-Israel. It's not anymore. And it, if, if you're a prog it's not, I, I, I do a lot of stuff with campuses, I know it goes on campuses, you're the, the pro, I won't call them pro-Israel, I hate the phrase pro-Israel, because they support policies that will lead to the, the destruction of Israel, so why is that called pro-Israel? If you're supporting Netanyahu, you're supporting the end of the Jewish state. I mean, really, what if you, I mean, but they will use the term the way they use it. The pro-Israel kids, the APEC kids, are on the defensive, which is why a movement like BDS, which is not that big a movement and hasn't had these great victories yet drives them insane why are they so hysterical about bds if bds isn't accomplishing something it's obviously accomplishing something and i think i mean to have people like stuart eisenstadt you know a big shot in the united states government who oh my god he's hysterical about bds if if everything is going in their direction what the hell are they so afraid of and they're afraid all the time. I got fired from Media Matters because they were afraid. You know what I did? Well, it was Alan Dershowitz who got me fired, so hey, Alan. Um, I may be retired, but you're senile. Um, um, what Alan Dershowitz did, he took out an ad in the, New York, in the New York Times which said, and this is the way APAC and their bunch operates, if M.J. Rosenberg continues working at Media Matters and continues using the word Israel firster, which I kind of coined the idea of calling them Israel firsters, if he stays there, I will not support the Democratic Party. I will not support Democratic now, blah, 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 and neither will any of my friends. And within, a, I mean, I, at the time I didn't admit it, but now it's so many years later I can say it, I was fired within a week. I mean, the big donors picked up the phone and made threats. And that is how it works. That is how it's been working in this country for decades. You st this, the, this, if, Pal if the Palestinian movement is the civil rights issue of our age, the pro-Israel movement is the McCarthyist issue of our age. In which, you know, which is why, you know, which is why it's very hard for candidates to say what they think. I listen to what, I look, I'm appalled by what both Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders say about Israel. But on the other hand, I know what they're up against. They're up against money power. Forty percent, forty percent of the money that goes to the Democratic Party is bundled by APAC. Forty percent, you can't. The Republicans have so many sources to get money from. Everyone, every industry in the country will support the Republicans because they're the pro-business party. The Democrats have very few obvious sources, and one of the big ones are the Jews. And they insist, members of Congress and presidential candidates, in believing that the Jews all stand behind Netanyahu. And it's a lie. I worked on Capitol Hill for 20 years. You know how they think up there? If someone named Rosenthal says, Congressman Kennedy, here's $50 be, uh, because I love you and I support you. When Congressman Kennedy sees the name Rosenthal, he assumes this is money I'm getting because I support Israel. That's a great accomplishment that APAC has done when in fact, According to the American Jewish Committee, which is the definitive poll every four years that's done about issues that Jews care about, it, it's the largest poll, no competition. 
the number of Jews, the percentage of Jews who in any election vote or give money based on Israel is 4 to 6 percent. The, issue, the overwhelming issues are for Jews is equality, civil rights, gay rights, environmental issue, all these other issues. You add the Palestinian component to it as a progressive issue, that's going to be, I mean, you have, the fact of the matter is a lot of the people who are promoting Palestinian rights on the Hill and in, this, and in Washington are Jews. We have to change the face of it so that they see so that they begin to understand, just because you're Jewish, just because you're this, you're not supporting Netanyahu. It's hard for them to understand, because they're dense. Most of them, I have to say that. <laughs> they really are. I mean, I have to. I worked for so many good ones. I worked for Carl Levin, who was absolutely brilliant, but was terrified of the lobby as well. I mean, the Jew, the, so you could be depressed about their power, and I was, and then came the Iran vote. I was absolutely sure that Obama was going to lose. Why? Because, amazingly enough, around 10 years ago, APAC decided that, it, that their number one goal was no longer to maintain the occupation and make life miserable for Palestinians. Their number one goal is a war with Iran. A war with Iran that Israel would start and that the United States would come in right behind. They have been pushing all the, the sanctions, those, the, the, the sanctions bills, all the punitive stuff on Iran for over 10, well, actually 15 years. It's been 15 years they promoting it, and it all culminated this year on this vote. And Obama said, no, I'm doing this. Uh, um, Kerry said no, and then the Democratic Party lined up, amazingly enough, not behind the Prime Minister of Israel, but behind the President of the United States. And, and it was everyone. It was some of the worst members. Steny Hoyer, who is the minority leader of the House, he's APAC's enforcer. He's, he's not Jewish, so he's perfect. He's their enforcer. If you don't, if you don't support this, you're going to lose money. He voted with the President. And he would refuse to enforce for them. Cory Booker, this awful senator from New Jersey, who has been involved with APAC his entire life, voted against APAC on this issue. O overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, 90% of the Jewish members of the House and Senate supported Obama and not Netanyahu. Chuck, Sch if you remember when Chuck Schumer made his announcement, everyone thought, that's it. All the Jewish senators and everything were going to fall into line. You no one fell into line except Ben Cardin of Maryland. No one ever heard of him. So, I mean, it's really changing. And um, for the first time in my life, I feel really good. I don't feel defensive. I, wonder, I, I think the word defensiveness is really important. Certain issues you know you're winning when you see who's defensive. Gay rights, for instance. Who's defensive on that issue? I mean, the people who support it or the people who are trying to, you know, who in, who are trying to stop it? Um, um, African Americans, the whole civil rights movement. Who's defensive? Conf the ones who want the flag or the ones who don't want the flag? Who, you know, it's like, and this, the, the Palestinian issue has become one now where, and I know lots of Palestinians, and as the, as my life has progressed, I know, sadly or happily, I know many more Palestinians than I know Israelis. <laughs> it used to be very different. But I know none of the Palestinians I know fear for the future. They're optimistic about the future. They're depressed about what's going on right now. But they're confident about the future. It's the Jewish right. Remember, the Jewish right. Not all Jews. The Jewish right that's scared all the time. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? What's going to happen is the occupation is going to end. And as Rami said, this issue is going to be resolved because amazingly enough, it is one of the easier issues to resolve. We have all have known what the solution is going to be for years and years. It's just that each time we get close, 
I recommend for anyone, if you haven't read it, read The Truth About Camp David by Clayton Swisher, which explains how the Israelis sabotaged 2000. We were on the brink. You know, you read you know, do you know what, ha I, just, I just have to, this one thing drives me insane. <laughs> that Arafat, Ar the, you know, the whole Rabin-Arafat agreement was this, you know, was to be done in these stages and to be this five-year transition period. And each, each, and then the Israelis would hand over territory in stages, incrementally, to the Palestinians. And when they got to, the, when the Palestinians controlled 90%, at that point, they would go into what Rabin and Arafat called final status negotiations to end, to end the conflict once and for all. Barak, Ehud Barak, who came in as, a, as the peace prime minister, he immediately, first thing he did was he dropped the Palestinians completely and decided he would negotiate with Syria. Nobody was demanding he negotiate, but that was what he decided to do. Then when he got to it, he turned to Clinton and said, we have to make the Palestinians show their bad faith early. Let's go to negotiations immediately. Let's not wait till the Palestinians have 90%. Let's do it now. And Clinton went along with it, and the game worked perfectly. Arafat could not, was not able to deliver at that point. The Palestinians had gained basically nothing from the Oslo deal. And Barack got what he wanted was Intifada II. And nothing good has happened since. As, not to name drop, as President Bill Clinton said to me in 1997, okay, it was to name drop, um, <laughs> he said Yigal Amir was the only assassin in history who achieved all his goals. The bullet that killed Arafat killed the peace process, and unless, I mean, killed Rabin, killed the peace, we'll talk about the yeah. Arafat part <laughs> later. <laughs> um, Killed Rabin, and unless we do something, unless we do something, that's it, the that same process that you know that that lost Rabin, that ended Oslo, that gave us Intifada too. What's waiting in the wings is are the are the terrorists that we're that we are seeing in the streets of Paris. Israel doesn't want to negotiate. They say they can't talk with Hamas. Are in, if, if, if this continues at the rate things are going, they'll be begging to talk with Hamas. I mean, the point is, the only answer is talking. The only answer is negotiating. But the good news is, more and more people are coming around. That's why you are lucky to hear me speak in one of the few optimistic speeches I've ever given. Thank you. <laughs> That concludes our coverage of the conference entitled A New Day? Organizing to Change U.S. Policy on Israel and Palestine, a conference that took place recently in Cambridge, Massachusetts, featuring Rami Khoury, Nadia Ben Youssef, and M.J. Rosenberg. We'll be back with more after this short program ID. You are watching the Arabic Hour a program of news, views, culture, cuisine, and the Arab-American experience. To view today's program or any previous program, log on to our website at www.arabichour.org. Thank you so much for joining us. On behalf of all of the volunteer staff here at the Arabic Hour, this is Rinwa Hakim, and I look forward to seeing you next week. The Arabic Hour has been brought to you in part by the William G. Abdullah Memorial Library, a resource center for information and education on the Arab American experience. The American Arabic Benevolent Association, an umbrella organization for community endeavors. The Nicholas G. Barham Veterans Association and Ladies Auxiliary, providing veteran services, scholarships with community pride. And by our members as well as contributions by viewers like you.